All right. Um, so good afternoon again, everybody. We've got participants continuing to join. I know this is a really popular talk this afternoon. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Amanda. I'm executive director with EOS Eco Energy. And um, I just wanna let everybody know uh, to remain mute, muted, um, just so that it's easier to hear our presenter this afternoon. Uh, if anybody does have a question though, please use the chat box at the bottom um, of the screen here. You'll see a little chat bubble. And if you click on that, that'll open the chat box. Um, alternatively, if you have a burning question, you can put your hand up and we can unmute you so that you can ask a question that way, but the chat box works pretty well. Um, also, I'll let everybody know that we're recording the webinar this afternoon because we know of additional folks who are interested but who just aren't able to join us this afternoon. And so we will be putting the recording on our YouTube channel probably tomorrow. So if you know of other folks who weren't able to join, they can check out our YouTube channel. Uh, that's the EOS channel. Um, and then I also just want to wish everybody um, a happy and productive climate change week. We're a little bit more than halfway through. I also want to thank our New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund because they've provided us with the funding to coordinate the week's events. So thank you to the uh, New Brunswick ETF. If you're interested in uh, more of Climate Change Week and the rest of the events we have going on this week, I will also shortly post um, the link to the calendar of events in the chat box. You can check that out afterwards. Um, and then this afternoon, we're going to be exploring food sustainability and climate change with Dr. Holly Abandonato. And so Holly... There's still people joining. Um, okay, so uh, Holly is an assistant professor at Mount Allison University and she specializes in plant ecology, native seed quality, grassland restoration, climate change and Arctic plant phenology. And Dr. Holly will be talking about um, emissions within all food sectors and tips to reduce emissions regardless of our diets. So now I wanna hand it over to Holly and welcome. Thank you, Amanda, for that welcoming. Um, wow, I have to say I'm really impressed to see so many people. I really didn't know what to expect in terms of a turnout. Oh, and we're still getting some more people. So um, as Amanda mentioned, my name is Holly and um, I'm currently working at Mount Allison and I'll talk a little bit about myself and my background soon. So thank you EOS Eco Energy for allowing me to speak. I see some familiar names actually in the audience. So just to do a little icebreaker, I think you guys can use the chat, but I was just wondering where you guys are from. Are you from Canada? Are you from other countries? I didn't really know um, what to expect in terms of how far this uh, webinar would reach. So definitely feel free to, to throw it in the chat. Okay, I see Nova Scotia, PEI, Sackville, Halifax, Dartmouth, Fredericton, Sweden, awesome. Another Fredericton, British Columbia, Moncton. Cool. All righty. So let's get started. I'm just going to minimize. I have like five or six um, names on my screen. I'm just going to minimize them so I can see a bit better my slides. Philippines, holy moly. Calgary. Uh, there we go. Okay. So. A little bit about me to start. So I'm a plant ecologist. I consider myself a generalist because I've uh, worked on a number of different projects that have been within the science and social science disciplines. Um, I don't tend to focus typically on one thing these days. I'm highly adaptable. And that kind of originated during my undergraduate degree. Like many of you who um, went to university or college or any type of program, you maybe didn't know what you wanted to do. And I was definitely one of those students. I initially started in the marine biology program at UMB St. John. And then I realized that marine biology wasn't a good option for me because I'm afraid of deep water. And yeah, I just couldn't be a marine biologist. I felt like it would, it would be embarrassing. And I grew up being um, heavily 
um, in, in, engulfed in gardening. So I always liked plants, but I didn't actually think I was going to study them. So I switched to the Fredericton campus because I decided I wanted to also look more at social sciences. So I did a BSc in biology and a BA in anthropology. And around the end of my undergraduate degree, UMD created a new um, Bachelor of Science called Environment and Natural Resources. And I remember thinking, man, that sounds like it's perfect for me. I'd like to actually switch out of biology and do this instead. And my advisor said to me, well, why don't you stay in biology because you're almost at the end and consider staying in longer to do a BS ENR. And originally I thought that's crazy. It would, would be so weird to have three bachelor's degrees, but I ended up doing it. They convinced me and it took me about six years, which is not bad, um, though I had to take courses in the summer and the spring. And I ended up getting to take a number of forestry courses that basically brought me back to the plant world. So I just loved my BS ENR degree and I ended up doing a concentration um, in wildlife management. And I'm not sure if that concentration exists anymore because there's been some changes to the program, but I just loved it. Um, I got to learn about policy. I got to use my social science a little bit. And then I decided that I wanted to study plants. I found an opportunity in Northern Norway and I just felt like I had to take it. I, I had never been to, well, I guess I should say I had been to Europe, but I'd only been to the UK. I'd never been to Scandinavia. And I just thought, you know what, I'm gonna do it, let's go. So I um, ended up doing a project at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, where I did my field research in the high Arctic in Svalbard. And I lived in Tromso in the low Arctic circle. And that was my first taste into studying plants and climate change. I got to learn a lot about um, polar amplification and how climate change is impacting not only plants, insects, fungi, reindeer populations, um, plankton. It was a really diverse opportunity and I really enjoyed the experience. And I almost stayed there for my PhD, but I actually found a different opportunity and that was in um, Italy. I had met my partner who was originally from Spain while I was studying in Norway and I, I wanted to stay in Europe and Italy sounded like a pretty good place. And this was a unique PhD, not your typical PhD where you take courses and do research. It was more integrative and um, it was called the Maria Skodowska Curie Initial Training Network where we were 11 students and it was focused on uh, state of the art training in academia as well as industry. So I changed my project a little and I focused on ecosystem restoration, uh, in particular grassland restoration using uh, local native seeds as well as restoration policy within Europe. So then I came back. Um, I returned to Canada in the end of 2017. And that was when I had the opportunity to teach at UMB, which felt really good, especially because I got to teach in the BSc ENR um, department. And I was teaching uh, a course called Climate Change as an adjunct. And that was when I started to delve into food sustainability and climate change. Food was something that always interested me. Um, being an active and an avid gardener, um, I was always interested in ways that we could grow produce better or how we could use companion crops or native species to bring in pollinators. So it was something that was always in the back of my mind and I didn't really get the opportunity to dig into the resources until I got to teach that course. Oh, and I should mention my current position now. So I'm currently at Mount Allison. I'm doing a term position in the Department of Geography and Environment. I mainly teach environmental science courses and I've had a number of independent study students and experiential learning students that work on a number of things such as um, invasive plants, uh, especially wetland invasive plants, native seed um, collection and use for restoration, uh, various pollinators, and I'm also very active at the Fredericton Botanic Garden Association since um, I'm originally, well my family's originally living in Fredericton. Um, I decided that I wanted to get involved with the garden when I moved back. And this is my baby. Um, this is the pollinator garden. We're hoping to launch it next summer. And it's just waiting some signage and a bee hotel. And we've gotten a lot of positive feedback 
And it's a combination of both ornamental pollinating plants as well as native species. And we've seen already a number of butterflies, including monarch butterflies, bees, including social and solitary bees, and hummingbirds. So it's doing its job, even though it's very new. And then to the right um, is actually one of my students collecting seeds from Joe Pieweed, which is a common upland plant. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about global food systems. I can't go into everything, but I feel like I should be able to take this time to go through some uh, major topics that you guys probably already know about or may not be familiar with. Um, in addition to that, um, I wanna highlight how complex global food systems are in relation to climate change. There are some things we can do, and there are some things that we don't necessarily have the answer to um, in terms of whether or not we should be reducing them. And there are just some technologies that aren't yet improved, but maybe in the coming future. So on the left is actually my first um, veggie garden that was all mine. Um, I focused a lot on native plants. I didn't learn a lot about um, vegetables during my um, uh, studies as a, a grad student. So it was very new to me. And um, that's my mom in the back. She's helping me to weed and harvest. And I remember just being so overjoyed by the process. I really didn't know what I was doing, but I figured having a plant background, I should be able to do this. So I, I read a couple books. I learned about companion planting, how to attract pollinators, et cetera, et cetera, soil. And I I didn't actually think it was going to turn out like this. Now, there are some things there that I probably shouldn't have done, but overall, I was super happy with how my garden turned out. And it just really pushed me towards learning more about food sustainability. And then to the right is a photo um, of some apertivos in Italy. Um, I was studying in the Northern Alps. And um, meat is fairly commonplace, though uh, the Mediterranean diet is also quite common in Italy. Um, more so um, probably in coastal regions, but not only is meat a substantial part of their diet, dairy is also really important. And when I lived in the Alps, there were dairy cows um, free ranging on the mountains, literally sometimes a thousand meters up. It was incredible to see. And the people were so proud of their cheese and the cheese they produced from these dairy cows. So it, it really highlighted to me the cultural importance of some products that sometimes get painted perhaps being really um, bad for the environment, but might not necessarily always be so, or the complexities of it are not well known. All right, so I wanna start with this really technical diagram from the IPCC report. So um, the Interpanel on Climate Change, it's always a mouthful, um, report that was put out in 2014. So this is essentially the most recent one, though we're going to be getting a new one. I think it's next year in 2022. And um, this is a figure found in the section called the summary for policymakers. So it's meant to sort of be a figure that um, policymakers can use or adapt if they need to, to try and understand um, regional key risks throughout the world. As you can imagine though, there's a lot to take in and it may not necessarily be so easy to do so. But I wanted to highlight a few different things. For example, food is actually mentioned in the IPCC report from 2014. We can see that a little tractor, even though it's a bit blurry and I apologize, um, highlights potential risks related to food production. Now, this is not a comprehensive and extensive figure. There are food production issues in other parts of the world as well, but some of the major ones have been highlighted and much of the risk is at a medium level. And um, some of that risk can be uh, mitigated. For example, that shaded bar in front of the orange bar is actually our potential to actually improve the situation versus say that solid orange, which is our risk. So we can see it in um, food highlighted in South America, Africa, and Asia as major areas for concern. That being said, we could argue too that the fish symbol might also indicate issues related to food, for example, fisheries and aquaculture. So we can see fish pop up in a number of places, in polar regions, um, in the Caribbean, and in our oceans, as well as down in Australasia. 
So there's definitely a lot to consider when it comes to food systems, food sustainability, and food security. But what do we do with this information and how do we make sense of it? So the IPCC talks about a couple things. Um, in terms of food security, it talks about how um, there are current risks in sensitive marine areas, likely species redistribution. So we're seeing um, fish species, for example, starting to migrate north. Um, we're seeing a biodiversity reduction. An example of that might be coral bleaching. So we know that some species are getting hit hard by changes in temperature of the ocean. Other areas like tropical and temperate areas are seeing reduction in crop productivity. For example, wheat, rice, and maize are some major ones as well as some species that actually might benefit from increased temperature or increased precipitation. And then the third uh, major issue is water resources, which I'm not gonna get into too much in this talk, um, but in certain areas, we're seeing a reduction in surface and groundwater, um, primarily in dry subtropical regions where we're seeing um, enhanced desertification. So I wanted to begin with this quote that talks about greenhouse gas emissions on a global scale. So food makes up 26%, so about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions, which is equivalent to 13.7 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. So while food is very important, it's not making up the majority of the greenhouse gas emissions, but it's making up a pretty big proportion. There was this publication that came out in 20, is it 2018 or 19? I think it was 19 actually by The Lancet. And it's a really interesting paper, somewhat technical, but there's some really neat uh, sections that go over food that I'm gonna uh, show you. It's called Food in the Anthropocene, the Eat Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems. And it talks about all sorts of sustainability issues, but it focuses a little bit on greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm gonna use that um, to sort of paint the picture of some of the issues related to food sustainability and climate change. So this was one that was very interesting to me. On the bottom, we can see dietary intake from 2016. Um, you don't have to worry about the reference dietary intake percentage. And then on the y-axis, we can see the various food types or dietary patterns. Now. Red meat or any type of dietary pattern consumption is not the same everywhere. Some countries consume more red meat, some consume less. The same thing for starchy vegetables, eggs, poultry, dairy, etc. So it's important to keep that in mind when making global recommendations. There's also cultural value that tends to go alongside some of these foods. For instance, coastal areas are really big on fish and seafood. Um, there's economic value. Maybe you choose foods based on price rather than specific food groups. There are many things to take into consideration when talking about food and, and the food selections that we make. But interestingly, what we can see is we can look at some global regional patterns. So uh, the global patterns are indicated by the red bars. And we can see more or less that red meat is fairly heavily consumed. Starchy vegetables as well eggs, and then the rest of them are either moderate to low. If we look at, for instance, South Asia, we can see that actually red meat consumption is very limited, very low actually um, within that region. Um, they consume uh, a lot more of starchy vegetables than they do of meat. And then for instance, if we jump to fish, we can see that they um, consume moderate amount of fish. And then lastly, we can jump to North America, which is that light pink bar. And it was a bit shocking for me when I first saw it. I didn't realize that North America consumed that much red meat. Like I knew we consumed a fair amount, but I didn't know that we were overtaking the world when it comes to our red meat consumption. And then looking at a few other things, starchy vegetables are moderate for us. Eggs are fairly high. Poultry is fairly high as well. It's higher than um, pretty much every other country. Dairy, same. And then fish is lower, and then veggies, fruit were kind of similar to other countries. So that was a bit of a surprise to me. Another really interesting figure that they um, provide, and you don't have to look at the whole thing, I just want to highlight greenhouse gases. Um, I wonder if this will work. I think I can draw on here, or mouse. Can you guys see my mouse? 
Awesome. So I want you to focus primarily on this part of the graph, but I didn't want to cut out this uh, these other sections as well, because I'm not going to talk about other environmental issues related to food, but keep in mind that just because something is has a low greenhouse gas um, carbon dioxide equivalent doesn't necessarily always equate to environmental fr environmentally friendly, and we'll see some examples of that later. So looking at the various food groups, we can see when it comes to meat, which is this red um, uh, symbol, line and dot, that Ruminant meat, for example, tends to have the highest greenhouse gas, gas emissions per gram of carbon dioxide. So something we use often when we compare greenhouse gases is we look at carbon dioxide equivalents, which refers to if we put all the gases on the same playing field, which would mean, for example, we know that methane and nitrous oxide have higher global warming potentials. So what we do is we multiply them by a constant and we can... Um, basically make them equal to carbon dioxide and use this as a, a way to measure all greenhouse gases. So we're not only looking at CO2 in this situation, um, we're looking at all gases on a CO2 equivalency. So ruminant meat definitely by far outshines all of the other uh, dietary groups. That being said, though, it's extremely variable and um, wide ranging. So there are cases, oh, did my, oh there's my mouse where um, ruminant meat can be lower in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions. There's low impact and high impact um, beef production. However, it's very difficult, especially for consumers to know whether or not we're buying a low impact um, beef product or a high impact beef product. So in that sense, um, it, there definitely seems to be some merit around whether or not we should reduce our ruminant meat content. And ruminant meat can mean lamb, any really hooved animal. It can mean deer or venison. Um, it encompasses a variety of species. Then we have other um, animal-based products or meat-based products like pork and chicken, which are substantially lower than ruminant meat. Fish is somewhat wide ranging. And I'm gonna talk about a, a fish seafood case study later just to sort of explain why. Um, we can see dairy is not too bad. I mean, it's more than pork. Eggs, not too, too bad. And then if we move down to plant-based products, um, whether it's grains or legumes, we can see that in terms of greenhouse gas emissions are just substantially lower. And the, the variability uh, around them is, is not so um, unclear like it is with, for example, ruminant meat and fish. And then if we jump to some of these other um, potential environmental issues. We can see that land use um, is a major issue for uh, producing ruminant meat, as well as energy use, acidification potential, though we can see other things fall in, into this graph, and eutrophification potential. There are some notable things too related to plants. For example, energy use with some vegetables and some fruits can be high, for instance, if we're growing them in greenhouses. And then uh, eutroph eutrophication potential, had too much caffeine, um, is interesting too with certain fruits. So for example, when I lived in um, Northern Italy, the region was known for, besides producing the best milk because of these cows grazing on the mountainside, it was known for apples and it was known for grapes and producing wine. And they produced them very intensively there. And there was a paper that came out that found that um, people who live near the apple orchards actually had the highest rate of cancer. And that was because they were spraying a lot of both insecticides, pesticides, and fertilizers. So I just want to point out that there can be environmental issues related to plant-based crops. I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to focus purely on um, greenhouse gas emissions and how we can alter our, our diet to try and actually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but it doesn't always equate to environmentally friendly. Many times it does, but it, it depends on the situation. So here's another version of that same um, figure. This one was put in an article by BBC. They used a different data source. It was, I think, a year older but it shows more or less the same thing, same trends. It highlights um, a few different foods that we couldn't really see specifically in the other one. So for example, beef shows the same thing. Um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, they're very high, but they range a lot. So you can see you have low impact, high impact, average. 
Then we look at lamb, which is um, also falls with under the ruminant category, but you can see that it's substantially lower. So maybe different species might have different greenhouse gas emissions. Um, then they put farmed prawns. Now, I don't know why that one's up there. I know why some farm species can have higher emissions, but I don't know enough about shrimp. So I'm not going to try and explain that one. Um, chocolate. That was a really interesting one to see. So they state that a chocolate bar from the deforested rainforest emits more than a serving of low impact beef. Now, I didn't know about that. I hadn't come across that in any of the papers I read. So that was interesting for me. Farmed fish sort of falls where I expect it. Pork, chicken on the lower end of meat. And then we have a variety of other products. So to finish looking at the Lancet paper, which talks a lot about our global food systems, um, I wanted to finish with this um, figure, which is rather complicated, but I wanted to point out a few things to you. So these are projections of global emissions to try and keep global warming to well below two degrees, aiming for 1.5. So two degrees is what we agreed to under the Paris Agreement. And I wanna point out to you some of the emissions from fossil, or sorry, not fossil fuels, agriculture. I have, I'm just gonna move something here. It's blocking the graph. There we go. So we can see that um, the red line and yellow line are related to greenhouse gas emissions from food production. And according to the Lancet, total emissions from food production have been stable since 1990, growing less than 1% per year because increases in production have been offset by decreasing emissions intensity per unit of production. So in some respects, technologically wise, we're getting better at producing high yield outputs. And this means we're producing uh, less greenhouse gases often than say we did 20 or 30 years ago. What they also mention is that overall, we don't necessarily need to reduce our um, emissions from agriculture in terms of methane and nitrous oxide. So you can see those red and yellow to meet our target. So you can see how in total, um, what they've modeled, there's very little change in terms of how those emissions looked, say now in 20, 2018, 2020 versus how they look in 2050. That being said, the Lancet does advise that meat consumption is reduced because of how high the emissions are, especially red meat. And they focus on something different that I had to look into myself because I thought it was very interesting. And I've highlighted it with this red arrow. So there's a portion of this figure that illustrates land use and land use change from agriculture. And essentially what this is, is when we take a natural landscape and we convert it for agriculture, we actually take a carbon sink and turn it into a carbon source. So what they advocate is that we reduce land use change and we stop converting new land for agricultural purposes, um, in addition to potentially taking old agricultural land and restoring it back to some form of natural or semi-natural state to create um, a carbon sink rather than a carbon source. So their, um, one of their main um, points is that it's really critical that we reduce land use change for agricultural purposes. And what you can see is they hope that by 2050, we will no longer be doing this. And instead what we'll have is this new green box, which is actually a land use sink from ag agriculture. So it, it offsets our emissions, it's negative emissions. And by reducing land conversion and even restoring landscapes, we can actually put some of that carbon back into the ground. So they really focus on that aspect, which I didn't really know was something that we should be taking into consideration, but it is really critical. And I'll point out some examples soon. And then lastly, they also talk about investing in clean energy. A lot of our uh, missions come from energy use to try and have uh, zero carbon energy in terms of uh, the agricultural sector. So avoiding any fossil fuel emissions from energy sources is, is really key. So on to a few case studies. Um, some of these papers are really, really interesting and, and probably the first of their kinds in, in some respects. This was a paper published in 2014 in the journal Climatic Change. And it's entitled, 
dietary greenhouse gas emissions of meat eaters, fish eaters, vegetarians, and vegans in the UK. And um, while it's not necessarily a recent paper, the data in it for me was, was quite interesting to see. Um, they surveyed 65,000 people, so it's a pretty good sample size. The data, though, was fairly old from 1993 to 99, so hard to say um, if the diet patterns look the same then as they do now. The ages of um, the respondents were between 20 and 80 years old, and their general practitioner was the one that recruited them and provided them a food frequency questionnaire. So why are greenhouse gas emissions important to not only um, connect to food production, but in particularly in the UK, greenhouse gases from agriculture account for one fifth of all greenhouse gases, gas emissions in the UK. So we talked earlier how in, on a global scale, agriculture accounts for about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. It's a bit less in the UK, it's only one fifth, but doesn't necessarily uh, mean it's not relevant. So they wanted to compare meat-based diets with plant-based diets and try and quantify the greenhouse gas emissions of these diets by um, looking up 130 different food items. And they have these amazing supplementary tables that list I think like over 100, 130 different foods and what their potential um, kilogram carbon dioxide equivalent are. So for example, apples are 0 0.7, coffee is 10.1, and bovine meat is 68.8, just to give you a bit of a scale. And then what they wanted to do was look at the emissions of these food groups per 2000 kilocalories. So they divided up people into, I think it's six groups. You could be a high meat eater, a medium meat eater, a low meat eater, a fish eater, a vegetarian, and a vegan. So what did they determine? Well, in short, what they found was that high meat eaters um, basically consumed um, in total, if we look at 2000 kcals, um, they actually emitted 7.9 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalency in comparison to some of the other food groups. So I skipped medium because it just falls in the middle, but we can see that low meat eaters produce almost half, just a little bit over half the amounts of high meat eaters and high meat eaters consume, I believe it was over a hundred grams of um, meat a day. So that was how they um, categorized a high meat eater. So that would be about 700, over 700 grams a week. And then fish eaters and vegetarians surprisingly produce similar amounts of greenhouse gases, which was, I didn't expect to see that. So I, I highlighted it there. And then vegans were uh, at the bottom. Though surprisingly, there's not a lot of difference between fish eater, vegetarian and vegan compared to say high meat eater and a low meat eater. So let's look at this in a practical way. What does this look like per person if we start reducing or changing our diets? So for example, if we were to go from a high meat diet to a low meat diet, we would reduce our emissions by 920 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalency per year. If we were to switch from a high meat diet to a vegetarian diet, that would be about 1200 kilograms versus a high meat diet to a vegan diet would be 1500 kilograms per year. So you can see even at the very top and the low end going from high meat to low meat can actually make a, a world of a difference. Now, what do these values represent? It's sort of hard to make sense of whether or not these are even high or low. So um, for context, if we compare say a flight from New York to London, that flight would emit 960 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents. So it would be pretty much a, the same as switching from a high meat diet to a low meat diet. However, um, that switch would be for a year and this would just be for one flight versus a small car. So this is probably not a great example. This was a study from the UK and there are a lot of small cars there. There aren't really a lot of small cars here. Um, and that would be a car that drove for 6,000 miles or close to 10,000 kilometers. Um, it would emit about 2,400 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So in some 
some respects, you could say it's really relative depending on um, the other sources of emissions. If you're somebody who's a frequent flyer, maybe you would prefer to, you know, reduce how often you fly transatlantically versus um, switching to a vegan diet, you'd prefer to go from high to low meat. So the way that we look at these things um, can be more complex than just switching, say, to from eating meat to being vegan. I wanted to also talk a little bit about um, the beef sector uh, specifically. We talk about ruminant meat, but beef tends to be the major producer and emitter within that. And uh, many of you may be familiar with um, enteric fermentation. If not, I'm gonna explain it in a second. So beef production is the largest industry in the agricultural sector. And cows produce methane by enteric fermentation. So, um, if you want to consume grass, you need basically four stomachs in order to break down the cellulose. So we're omnivores, we can technically consume plant matter, but we couldn't consume grass without having this four chambered stomach. So this is an adaptation for herbivores who consume plants or plant matter with high amounts of cellulose. However, it also means that if we um, have or produce uh, large amounts of these species, whether it's cows or, or sheep, um, we're producing some form of methane. So methane um, from enteric fermentation is a natural process. A deer, for example, in the forest would also um, likely have that four-chambered stomach and produce methane through burps. So most of this methane is coming out of the mouth, not from the other end, though a lot of people tend to think that's the case. Now, there's been a number of technologies trying to improve this. So for example, there's research now looking into feeding um, cows a diet that would reduce the amount of methane they produce. And what they're looking at right now is feeding them seaweed, though this research is still in its infancy and there's some details they need to iron out. In addition to that, some species produce less methane than others. For example, kangaroos, um, which are consumed in Australia, and I know you can find kangaroo meat sometimes here, um, they actually don't uh, release as much methane as cows do. They're one of the lowest releasers um, in methane concentrations. And then in terms of other greenhouse gases produced from um, beef production, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxides um, can be released from manure storage, feed crops, machinery, and soil carbon. So methane is not the only greenhouse gas that is released from beef production. However, it is pretty much the major source in terms of the greenhouse gas footprint. It ranges from 55 to 92%. So again, there's a lot of variation within uh, how beef is produced, what technologies are used, um, how long they're outdoors, indoors, what type of feed uh, they consume, et cetera. In terms of beef production, uh, there are a number of countries that um, focus a lot on this sector and ones with the highest greenhouse gas emissions are most likely China. So there's this paper that I'm using uh, to look more closely at this data called Carbon Footprint of Beef Cattle. It's, um, it was published in 2012 in the journal Sustainability. And the authors in this um, study mentioned that they were unable to get any data for China and India. However, they believed um, that China may be actually the country that has the highest greenhouse gas emissions because their, their productivity is quite low. However, looking at the, the countries where we do have data, Brazil ranks supreme and not just by a little bit, it's actually double the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in comparison to other countries. So Brazil is really at the forefront of greenhouse gas emissions when it comes to beef production. United States is next, uh, typically in the Midwest, followed by Eastern Canada, the European Union and Western Canada. And I'll talk a little bit about those differences in Canada in a second. Oh, and this is a photo actually of cows in the Alps. So you can see that um, some of the landscapes where they are actually really, really beautiful. And um, some of the farmers are working now with researchers to select certain native plants that will actually um, make their cheese and milk taste differently. And um, I, I find it interesting and kind of weird, but in some respects, it's good for grasslands because a lot of grasslands are extremely um, 
artificial or they use a lot of cultivars. So the more native plants we can bring back to these areas, the better, even if it's to work with, for instance, dairy farmers. So looking at Brazil, this is, this is really a key point, I think, in my talk, just because the amount of environmental um, degradation and greenhouse gas production is just really insane. Um, in Brazil, there are about 210 million cows and 52 million are for beef production. Now, the problem that occurs here is that 70% of these cows are raised in sub-Amazon cerrados, which are tropical savannas. And these are areas with high endemism, which means uh, species that aren't found anywhere else in the world occur here. So we really don't want to be cutting down or um, demolishing these areas just because of not only the high biodiversity, but because they're carbon sinks. And by doing that, not only are we removing the species, we're allowing a lot of carbon to escape from deforestation. And then we're putting cows on there that we know also add more greenhouse gases. So it's, it's really a perfect storm and it, it's not a good thing. So right now we know that Brazil is already double um, the other countries in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. However, if we actually account for the deforestation that's going on there um, in order to convert, say, forest land or tropical savannas into pastures, this number could actually be 16 times higher. So we really do not want to be um, purchasing beef or consuming beef that comes from Brazil just because of what's happening to these landscapes. And, and really, the emissions are just astronomical. The BBC also um, created their own image that's a bit more user friendly than some of the ones I'm showing you. And they lump Latin America all together. So it would have been nice if we could see Brazil, but we can't. But we can still see that the climate footprint of um, one serving of beef is impeccably high in Latin America. Um, interestingly, though, Asia now is way at the bottom, which seems to uh, conflict with the study that um, the study that I showed you that mentioned that China is likely one of the higher producers of greenhouse gas emissions. Something too that caught my eye, which I can explain this, is water use is extremely high in, in Asia, similar to Latin America, even though beef production is fairly low. And I'm not really sure why this is the case. So when it comes to beef production in Canada, if we look at some of the data, we can see that we produce about 13.4 million cows and 4.3 are for beef. And over the years, emissions have actually reduced about by 30%. And um, what we know as well is that Eastern Canada produces uh, more emissions than West. Western Canada. And the reason is mainly related te to technology and conservation management. So in the West, we have better soil conservation practices. Um, so there's less carbon that's escaping from the soil and pastures. If we look at this table below, if we just jump to the data, we can see in 1981, uh, the emissions were about 16.5 kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalency per kilogram. Um, whereas in Western Canada, that value was actually a bit higher. And then as time moves on, you can see that our emissions are reducing, though they are still fairly high. Eastern Canada is the third uh, highest um, emitter of greenhouse gases when it comes to beef production. Thinking about Canada and, and whether or not this is important or relevant, if we look at Canada's total sources of greenhouse gas emissions, well, we um, release emissions from a number of different areas and sectors. Our largest emitter is actually oil and gas. So we produced 27% um, of our total emissions from that sector, followed by transportation, and then uh, forestry, agriculture, waste, and waste, and industry are tied followed by homes and buildings and electricity. So in the context of Canada, agricultural emissions aren't really our worst offender. There are other things that we could improve upon, you could argue. But it doesn't mean that it isn't relevant. If we look at the data a little more closely, we can see in total, um, if we look at the trends in greenhouse gas emissions from all the combustion sources, 
that um, there are other major sources of greenhouse gases. This is data actually from the National Inventory Report from 1990 to 2017, looking at greenhouse gas sources and sinks in Canada. And this data goes all the way till 2018, which is great. It's nice to have some, some uh, more recent data. And um, agriculture, interestingly, falls in the other section, which is that blue line at the very top. So you can see that, for instance, oil and gas makes up a good proportion and actually is increasing. Um, and I think that increase started around sort of the mid 2000s, um, which corresponded with the Alberta tar sands, but I could be wrong, but I think that's the reason for the increase. And we can see things like public electricity and heat production were very high, they are starting to decrease. And then if we look at, for instance, other it seems fairly steady, the trend looks quite similar to the Lancet uh, figure that we saw earlier, where we saw the red and yellow bars. So it's, it's, it's not a significant portion compared to other industries, but it's still pretty relevant. If we look at agriculture alone, we can see that the bulk of this falls under um, greenhouse gas emissions from enteric fermentation, which is no surprise. And another aspect that we don't really talk about when it comes to climate change is actually agricultural soils. And I'm going to um, talk about that a little bit later. And then manure management sort of falls in between. So soil and enteric fermentation really seem to be the major emitters here in Canada when it comes to greenhouse gases associated with agriculture. So I'm going to finish my section on beef. So some takeaway messages that I have is I definitely think it is valuable to reduce your intake of ruminant meat to at the very minimum a low meat diet. And to be honest, less than 50 grams a day is really not that bad. And I think it's not something that's difficult. So if you don't necessarily want to go to a, a, a fish based diet, vegetarian or vegan diet, I think it's reasonable to say that um, switching your diet from high meat, if you are a high meat eater, to low meat is, is still going to be really, really helpful to the environment. And um, 50 grams a day would be about 350 grams a week. So I, I think it's, it's pretty doable for most people. And then when it comes to beef, and when we buy beef, if you decide you want to buy beef, make sure that you buy local whenever possible. Um, and by that, I mainly mean Canadian beef because we know that uh, the emissions from our sector aren't as significant as perhaps other places and other countries. But even more so, we really need to avoid meat from Brazil. At this point, after reading that paper, I, I feel like beef from Brazil should be banned. Like it's, it's just so detrimental to the environment. It's really not in our best interest to be um, getting meat and consuming meat from Brazil. It's different for the local people perhaps, but for Canadians, I really don't think um, we should be getting meat from Brazil. And that's something simple, well, fairly simple that we could do. And then in terms of other beef you purchase, ideally we wanna purchase low impact beef. So we saw there was a huge variation in the data set in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. However, it's really difficult to know what low impact beef is. And I tried to look into it and I couldn't find any consensus because there are so many processes that go into beef production um, from feed to grazing, um, to processing, to transportation. And it's really difficult to know exactly what low impact beef is. And of course it's not labeled. You can't go and find it in the grocery store. Um, one article I read mentioned it might be grass fed meat but it was like a generic news media article. So I don't know if that's true or not. And then there are a lot of new technologies coming out in terms of improving feeds that might reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as trying to make um, any areas that we use for beef production as productive as possible, whereas in developing countries, we tend to see more low productivity. So there are some things you can do. You don't necessarily have to jump to a completely or soil based plant based diet um, to reduce your emissions. You can try and do um, some other things like uh, eating less meat, ruminant meat and buying local. So next, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about marine products. Um, I think they're really important, primarily because they are one of the largest traded commodities worldwide. So I have a lot of friends, Canadian friends, that, that don't eat seafood or fish. Um, but 
some cultures and uh, regions really rely on marine products. Um, my partner from Spain is from a coastal region and seafood is, is their life. They're so proud of their seafood. They try to be sustainable. They're pretty transparent when it comes to labels way more than they are here. Um, the seafood is extremely fresh. I don't find the seafood here very fresh in comparison. Um, so it is an important product that um, is integrated in many countries and many regions. However, there are environmental problems that we do know about related to marine products, such as issues with bycatch, so catching uh, other species that aren't the target species, then discarding them. For instance, oftentimes when you catch other species, they end up dead in the nets. Um, so you discard them and you're impacting their populations. Um, as well as marine ecosystem degradation from various fishing techniques like trawling um, can impact uh, various species and ecosystems. But I won't go too much into that. Some countries are working a lot on this. For instance, I know before I left Europe, I had heard about um, new policies they were putting in about uh, reducing bycatch. However, now we've kind of moved in a different direction. And greenhouse gas emissions are at the forefront of concern when it comes to marine products. And there's this dire need to examine the supply chain emissions. So um, anytime we look at various food products, there are a number of different um, processes and cycles within that that we need to look at. And they can be really difficult to quantify in terms of emissions. But now we're getting pretty good at it. And um, we tend to refer to it as a life cycle assessment, but you don't have to worry about that. So things like processing, transport, and consumption account for a rel relevant portion of the environmental greenhouse gas emissions. So I wanted to give you an example from Norway since I did get to live there for two years and um, I also enjoyed some of the seafood products. Norway um, is very proud of their salmon and cod and actually the best salmon I've ever eaten I ate in Norway, not in Canada, sorry, Canada. Um, and their fisheries production is three times the amount of Canada. So they're a relatively small country in comparison to Canada, but they focus a lot on fisheries and aquaculture. It's predominantly marine, so they're not doing a lot of freshwater inland um, production. And they focus on both aquaculture and marine capture. They're export focused and they're the second largest exporter in the world. A product you might be familiar with here in Canada is Norwegian smoked salmon. I think it's one of their most famous international products, though I don't think I ate it much living in Norway. I ate smoked cod. Um, salmon, some weird parts of the fish that I can't remember exactly what they were, but I just remember being surprised by it. But culturally, cod is huge in Norway. I, I don't think there was a part of Norway that I visited that didn't have cod hanging that was drying. So they're very um, both culturally and economically um, connected to their cod industry and of course other species as well, which we'll see in a moment. Now we're going to move to a paper called The Carbon Footprint of Norwegian Seafood Products on the Global Seafood Market. So they're a good example because they do export a lot of their products. So we can look at transportation as one of the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions. In this paper, the authors examined more than 20 marine products, which is one of the uh, first of its kind. I also included seven different species, both within aquaculture and fisheries. They also looked at uh, various fishing techniques, but I'm not going to go too much into that. And then they examined uh, greenhouse gases that um, are a result of various modes of transportation and whether or not the product was sold fresh or frozen. So here's one figure from the paper. It was, it was one that I think had a, a pretty clear message. If we look at the bottom, we can see the seven different species. And on the y-axis, we can see greenhouse gas emissions. And overall, you can see that um, some species definitely had higher greenhouse gas emissions than other, others. Interestingly, salmon was really up there. And the main reason for this is because salmon is farmed in Norway and the bulk of the emissions actually come from feed production. So anytime an animal needs feed, we have to think about growing that 
whether it's a grain legume, a uh, byproduct of um, the meat industry, we need to be able to source that ingredient somewhere, whether it's growing or just a byproduct, and then we need to ship it to whether it's a, another pasture or to a fishery um, or inland aquaculture. So there's transportation as well as um, emissions from producing whatever that um, ingredient is. So that can really take a toll on the amount of emissions from a specific species. So farm species that require feed, very high emissions. However, mussels are also farmed in Norway, and I know they're farmed in Spain, but they don't require any feed. They actually um, will filter feed phytoplankton, so you don't need to add anything to the water. And as a result, you can see in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions, they're extremely low. So that's really interesting in terms of farming, that some species um, can be farmed and have low emissions, others not so much. And then if we look at some of the other uh, fish species that are from marine capture, we can see that there are a variety of different processing steps like refrigerants. So the longer you have to freeze something, the more emissions will be produced from energy. And then diesel is often used um, for the boats, for instance, to go out and fish. They can be used in the fishery. And then a third aspect you don't see here is processing and transportation, which I'm gonna mention in the next slide. So what they found when looking at wholesaler fisheries emissions was that overall, the worst emitters were cod and haddock. And this was largely due to um, diesel required to go out and fish these species, refrigerants, processing, product transport, and packaging. However, it varied a lot. So for example, if you were producing cod that was fresh and it needed to get to market fresh, then you would need to transport that fish really quickly and very often. Whereas if you were to produce cod and then freeze it and then have it there for a month once you build up enough stock and then send it out, you might have higher refrigerant emissions, but overall your transportation emissions are down, which tend to be higher than refrigerants. So actually freezing any form of fish or seafood um, has a benefit in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Another important aspect is product transportation. So depending on how a uh, product is transported will impact its emissions. Anything transported by truck or by air, air freight, actually has much higher emissions than if it's transported by boat or by train. So what they did was they actually had examples where they looked at cod that was sold fresh, sold frozen, transported by ships, transported by rail, truck, or air. I didn't include the figures because they were a bit intense. But ultimately what they found was that frozen fish and fish transported by rail or boats had the lowest emissions. In addition, of course, where you ship that product matters. So if you ship that product from Norway to Paris or London, the emissions are substantially less than shipping it to China. So if you're exporting seafood, the further you export it, the more emissions as well. So overall, what they determined was um, local frozen seafood that was transported by boat or rail was the most um, efficient in terms of greenhouse gases. There were very little in comparison to fresh um, fish transported by air, for example, to China. And then when it came to wild or farmed species, what they found was, well, in some cases, wild had lower emissions like haddock or cod, but we know that depending on whether or not feed production is involved can greatly impact whether or not um, the emissions are high. So mussels, for example, have low emissions, but farmed salmon doesn't. So now I'm going to end looking at soil and crops. So soil is really the, the child, I guess the, the non-fluffy child of climate change that nobody really pays attention to. It's not very charismatic, but it's actually a major contributor of greenhouse gas emissions if it's not managed. So I'm going to talk about that. And then lastly, I'm going to end discussing some food security issues with uh, various plant crops. 
And so I'm just going to interrupt for a sec, college, just because it is four o'clock. And so if there's anyone who uh, needs to leave, you've got other things going on, feel free uh, to duck out and you'll be able to watch the rest of the webinar on our YouTube channel, uh, which we hope to get up on the, US, on the EOS page tomorrow. Um, but I'll, I'll let Holly wrap up. Sorry about that. I get too chatty sometimes when I talk about this. Oh, and I see I have some questions. So I'm just checking that. Somebody asked me about the dotted line. Um, alrighty, I'll go back to that a little bit later at the end of the talk. So um, in terms of soil organic carbon, and I'll try and be fairly brief with this, um, we actually have uh, 1500 gigatons of soil organic carbon currently in the world. And it's about one meter deep. However, in terms of how much we have varies um, by regions, whether you're a tropical, arid, or cold region, it can be anywhere from 30 to 800 tons per hectare. So in general, anytime we convert land from its natural state to agricultural land, we can remove anywhere from 60 to 75% of that stored carbon. Now, there are ways to minimize carbon loss, such as conservation tillage, so actually reducing the amount of times you till the soil, using cover crops, so plants that actually um, will help to prevent the soil from eroding away or uh, mineralizing. We can use things like agroforestry, irrigation, controlling any form of runoff, whether it's salinity uh, from nutrients. And then um, the big one that I'm gonna show you an example of is, is soil carbon erosion. So anytime we remove carbon from the soil, we're actually really reducing its productivity. So it's in our best interest to actually use some of these management strategies because our soil will be more productive if we're able to uh, store it and not just lose it um, to erosion or translocation or oxidation. So one example that I got to, to witness was during my PhD, I helped um, carry out field work for some of my colleagues that were looking at cover crops for olive orchards in southern Spain. And this is an aerial photo of an olive orchard um, close to Cordoba. And this area is known for its olives and citrus plantations. And I think it's actually the largest producer of olives in the entire world. It was either the first or second, but I believe it might have been the first. And you can see that there's not really a lot of vegetation besides the rows of trees. And this can be incredibly problematic. Um, erosion is extremely common. And when I was driving down to the olive grove, I could see all of these shades of brown that I'd never seen before when I looked at soil. I saw red and maroon. And, and I remember thinking, oh, that's not good. Like, why, why am I seeing all this barren soil? And we got to the olive grove and the work that we were going to do was we wanted to take samples to get baselines of the quality of the soil and look at the soil seed bank to see if there were any native plants even able to persist. The soil was so hard that I actually needed to use a pickaxe to be able to get, um, I think it was like 500 milliliters, which is not a lot. And it was pretty devoid of life. And I learned from the students working there that what they often do is they use machines. These machines come in and it, they either spray the olives with various herbicides to keep um, plants from growing in between them, or they use machines to remove any plants. So there's tractors and machines going through them all the time. And um, Europe knows that they need to do better. And there's a lot of pushes both by the European Union and Spain to try and improve the environmental quality of these sites, because not only is there an immense amount of soil carbon being released and it has to be added back every single year, multiple times a year, it's devoid of biodiversity. You couldn't hear any birds. You couldn't see it. I think we saw spiders in the soil and that was pretty much it. And they were really um, sparse. And so what um, my colleagues were doing was they were looking to uh, determine which plant species, native plant species would be good cover crops that wouldn't outcompete the olives and outcompete the resources. So um, overall, you can see that the way we 
um, grow food and the way we think about things like ecosystem services and pollinators and preventing things like soil erosion is, is really critical um, for long term, not only production for the olives, but also economically and um, for biodiversity purposes. So when we deplete soil organic matter, we can actually see a lot of different um, problems occurring such as soil degradation, nutrient depletion, decline in environmental quality, decline in agronomic and biomass productivity. And then in developing countries in particularly, we can see major issues of food insecurity, malnutrition and hunger. So for example, if you're growing a crop somewhere and it grows really well one year, and then maybe after two or three years, you've used up all the soil organic carbon, that crop's not gonna grow so well. So you're gonna have a hard time uh, growing food. So about, I just have to move the videos on my text, about 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions from land conversion are from the soil as a result of soil degradation, accelerated erosion, mineralization. And there are countries that are hotspots for soil degradation, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, Central and South Asia, China, the Andean regions, Caribbean, and certain parts of South America. And this really is a, a food security issue. Now, on top of that, we know that climate change is having um, unintended consequences on a number of species, in particularly some of the crops we're growing. And uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is prioritizing climate change adaptation needs for food security in 2030. So this is looking at how climate change is actually impacting food insecure regions. So some of those areas that are actually hot spots for soil degradation are also getting hit by climate change the hardest. So it's really just a double-edged sword in some of these areas. So I don't want to absorb too much of this other than that there are major temperature changes, primarily increases and precipitation changes occurring in various regions. So those codes represent regions, AND, Andean, BRA, Brazil, SA, South, um, Southern Africa, EA, East Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of predicted changes, some of them with smaller ranges than others, but these are going to impact not only the people, but the plant crops that they're growing. And these specific codes highlight 12 regions that are actually countries with the highest statistics on malnourishment. Uh, the worst areas were South Asia, China, Southeast Asia, and East Africa. And this was determined by a hunger index percentage per population. And I'm just gonna skip that so that I don't spend too much time. So this was a figure that illustrates how a variety of crops are going to see a major change in production. So the x-axis is production impact. Um, the y-axis is the various crop. And then um, we have the code for the region. So China, um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, West Asia or Western Asia, West Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see, you don't need to take in all of this but there are a lot of predicted changes, some worse than others. There are some where we're going to see um, increases in production yield and other places where we're going to see uh, decreases and some crops that perhaps won't change a whole lot. Some notable examples, for instance, in East Africa, we can see that cow peas are going to be impacted uh, greatly. So this area is expected to see a major increase in precipitation. Cow peas are a type of bean that are very commonly consumed and they typically occur in semi-arid environments. So with more rain, it means that they're not gonna be able to do as well as they used to. And then we can see other species that might be doing better like barley, which would see almost a 30% increase in production. In West Asia, we're not seeing any massive changes other than in soybeans. And they're expected to see an increase in temperature. And then Southeast Asia, for example, there's not um, going to be any major changes, maybe a little bit in soybeans, but most of them seem to be close to that zero change um, reference line. So the authors wanted to really point out some of these areas of major concern. And what they determined was 
that South Asia and Southern Africa were actually um, the areas that would be hit the hardest as a result of climate change. So um, this is due to a combination of either projected increased temperature or decreases in precipitation. And this is going to impact a number of crop species. Um, however, there are some that, that may do better as well. Um, the, the sad part too is that we know that these are likely hotspots for soil degradation. So we're seeing areas that are going to experience lower productivity, but also most likely emit greenhouse gases if we don't maybe intervene or, talk, or go into these countries and try and encourage better conservation soil management plans. So food security in essence is very pressing in these regions. So without sufficient adaptation measures, many food crops may be negatively affected, though we know there's a wide array of variation in crop responses. All right, so all in all, I wanted to finish my talk with a few points, which is we know that reducing ruminant meat consumption is really essential, whether it's only reducing it um, from say 100 grams a day to 50 grams will make a major difference in the greenhouse gas emissions that you um, produce, as well as if you decide to consume seafood or fish, trying to focus on um, products like shellfish that um, don't necessarily rely on feed and have feed emissions, um, sourcing frozen local fish as much as possible rather than fresh, Support soil management. So we know that how we treat our soil is really important when it comes to emissions from agriculture. And we, we just don't tend to talk about it or think about it, but it is really crucial. Um, in addition, The Lancet made a really great point, which is that we need to discourage land use change, especially, especially in tropical rainforests where the effects are compounded. So we need to try and focus on not converting land for agriculture and if possible, even restoring uh, agricultural land in certain places where we can back to its either natural or semi-natural state. And then lastly, something that I really think is important is that we need more labeling and transparency when it comes to food. I know firsthand um, that when it comes to in labels and any type of environmental certification were really, really lacking. Some countries have better systems than others, but I would love to be able to go to the grocery store and select products based on low emissions. Now, again, that doesn't always mean that the product is the most environmentally friendly, but when it comes to climate change, at least we know that we can choose products with our wallet that might actually have lower emissions. So that's it for my talk. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions. I'm sorry for going over. I just get really, really into some of these studies and, and results and papers. So thank you very much for attending. Thanks so much, Holly. That was a really great talk. I'll, uh, I'll let anyone ask any questions he wants to, or Amanda, if you want to make any comments. Well, there was just one question earlier, Holly. Someone was wondering whether you would make your slides available. Oh, definitely. I would love to do that. And that was why I included some of the, the snippets of the study. So you guys can go back and, and look them up or use them if they're uh, interesting or useful for you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering when you're um, looking at the frozen food, are you taking to account like the cost of energy required to store the frozen goods? Yes. In that study, they were. Okay, thank you. I have a question too. Um, what are some of the ways that um, farmers in the Tantramar region have been adapting to climate change? And what are some, I guess, predicted changes that will, um, I guess, come about in the next few decades and how that'll impact the, the crops that are grown here? Now, I don't know if that's a question for me because because I am not familiar with um, what's going on here in terms of better farming practices or more sustainable farming practices. I just moved here uh, a year and a half ago. So I, I really don't know, but I would love to know. I don't know if anyone else can answer that. If any of you guys are farmers or know anything about uh, food sustainability in this region. In the Tantamar region, you know, 
impact of climate change is going to be all the things like that. Thank you. Probably did start at three. She's gone over. So I guess we missed most of it. Catherine, it's Suzanne Fournier with the National Farmers Union. Um, definitely some of the, the practices that we advocate for are based on agroecology and regenerative farming. Um, but I couldn't say whether they're at play uh, specifically in the Tantramar region. Um, if I could ask Holly, I'm curious of, um, in some of your slides, you referred, you referred to food production versus agriculture. Um, and obviously not all of the, you know, the goods that are produced go to food production. And I'm just wondering about the distinction there. Yeah, so I didn't wanna go into that too much just cause it's another layer that kind of complicates things. Um, for instance, the, the study on beef production talked about animal byproducts and it talked about other products from meat. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to add that element just because there were too many other things that I wanted to focus on. And of course, I talked a lot about beef production um, rather than dairy farming, just because I couldn't, I couldn't fit it all in there. But we know that there are a substantial amount of emissions also from uh, producing dairy products, though they are quite a bit less than um, producing uh, cows for beef. I have a question in the chat. Um, is there actually any wild Atlantic salmon left here or is it all farmed? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would love to say that there is, but I don't think you can eat it. I imagine it's protected because we just don't have a lot left. Um, I, from what I've seen, it's only farmed in the grocery store, but you can find wild salmon from, I think, the west coast of Canada. But again, I'm not a fish expert, so I don't know necessarily uh, what the answer is to that. And then another comment. Yeah, so um, I'm actually covering food waste in one of the courses I'm teaching, because it's something that I've started to look into, but I'm Again, I'm a plant ecologist. This is more of a hobby or something I integrate into my courses because I think it's really important that we discuss some of these difficult topics. So I'm hoping to get a better handling on food waste this term um, when we discuss it in my seminar class at, at Mount A. Any other questions? Um, I have another question. Uh, you suggested looking at agricultural land and how we can convert that to more like natural ecosystems. Um, have you come across any studies that is like a cost or emissions analysis of that process of converting agricultural lands to conservation areas? So I have found a study on the cost benefit ratio of restoring land to various habitats. It's not directly related to agriculture, but whether we restore a grassland, a forest, a coral reef, et cetera. And grasslands are actually some of the cheapest um, habitats to restore with some of the highest benefits because of the high biodiversity. They bring in insects, they bring in pollinators, which are actually very good for many crops. Um, they prevent erosion. Um, what else do they do? Some species actually fixate nitrogen so they can provide nitrogen to the soil. So there are definitely a number of benefits to restoring not necessarily agricultural land, but any land that we can to a more natural state. There's just a variety of ecosystem services. But on the other hand, they showed that restoring, for instance, coral reefs was incredibly expensive and the cost benefit ratio was very, very low. So it just depends how you, you look at it. If cost is all you you care about, then um, grassland restoration is a very easy way. Very interesting, thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's Lauren here from EF. I think Holly, you mentioned a restoration course maybe that you took or program. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? I'm just curious. 
Yeah, so that was um, part of my PhD because I was studying ecosystem restoration in Europe, uh, particularly policy and how we can use native seeds to try and restore areas. Um, I took so many workshops, it's, I don't even think I could count them all. But uh, the focus was on Europe, so it wasn't on Canada. However, I've been trying to um, bring that research here and it's been a bit of a struggle because much of the restoration and reclamation and rehabilitation we do here is uh, forest based. We don't tend to restore grasslands. There actually aren't really, um, they aren't the native uh, habitat here. Grasslands tend to grow more so either in the prairie region or on steep slopes where trees can't actually get a footing. However, what we can do is use them around wetlands. So I've been working a lot with Ducks Unlimited um, and a little bit with um, Jamie Burke from the town of Sackville to try and um, find native plants that we can source because a lot of the wetlands nearby are, are really full of a lot of invasive and exotic species. So I'm trying to take the research I've done from Europe and bring it here, but it's, it's difficult because we don't, we don't focus on grasslands and we don't actually have almost any native seed producers here. I mean, or the ones we do don't really produce enough for restoration purposes. So there's a lot to do in Eastern Canada when it comes to grassland restoration. And grassland restoration is a really easy way uh, to integrate um, both cover crops and prevent erosion in agriculture. And they're doing a lot of companion planting in Europe where they're planting native species around uh, various agricultural crops. Germany is at the forefront of this right now. Thanks so much, that's super interesting. You're welcome. So there's another question that's coming to me asking, would the impact of goat dairy products be less than that of cows? I don't know because none of the studies specified goats. Um, but the impression that I got was that cows had the highest um, emissions in comparison to any other ruminant, but I, I don't know. I wish I, did. I wish I knew the answer. All right, well, uh, thank you, Holly. And if there aren't any other questions, um, I want to thank you, Holly, for presenting. This is fabulous, tons of great information and lots to get us thinking. Um, and thank you to everyone for participating. And uh, enjoy the rest of Climate Change Week. Check out our schedule on the EOS page. Check out our YouTube channel for videos from uh, most of our webinars this week. And thanks again, everyone. Thank you. See you guys later.